our world is changing fast. And with this comes the need to keep pace. To create, evolve, and deliver solutions that meet our customers' needs and improve their lives. At Swift, we're collaborating with the brightest minds to make transactions faster, smarter, better. Because we believe some challenges are meant to be solved together. With our community, we're reimagining what we can achieve through innovation. Investing in a new AI platform that will power the creation of smarter solutions. Like real-time anomaly detection to validate transactions before they're sent. We're reaching into the world of central bank digital currencies to reduce fragmentation, connect up technologies, and enable new possibilities for sending digital money across borders. And we're guiding securities players through the emerging world of tokenized assets, increasing the speed and efficiency of post-trade processing to help a new market grow. These innovations will help our community adapt to finances' ebbs and flows. Not just to stay afloat, but to thrive and lead both today and in the future. But we're not embarking on this journey alone. We're encouraging our community to join us too, to innovate with us, and be part of shaping the future of finance. Faster. Smarter. Better. Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Innovation Live, a new series of shows here on LinkedIn in which we delve into the exciting innovations happening across financial services. I'm your host today, Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at Swift. And in our first session, we're going to be exploring digital assets and their potential to transform the worlds of payments and securities. And I'm delighted to have Sean Foley here with me today. Sean is Associate Professor of Applied Finance at Macquarie University and an expert on all things DeFi. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks so much for having me, Nick. It's, uh, it's always great to, to have these opportunities to talk together. Lovely. Well, thank you for make, making the time. And Sean, maybe let's, let's kick off. Uh, could you share a bit about your background uh, and research in this space? Totally, yeah. So look, I did my PhD uh, around eight years ago at the University of Sydney, and I ended up uh, doing it with the uh, Capital Markets Corporate Research Centre. And my industry partner was the Ontario Securities Commission, and they are the regulator for Canada, which led me to really undertake research based around um, the regulation of, of financial markets and looking at things like dark pools, high frequency trading, and, and generally taking really large amounts of, of trade and quote data and trying to process it to find things like insider trading or really just finding meaning right in in what um you know what was going on with with regulatory changes and things like this and i guess as i uh, was freed of my industry sponsor and and started to do whatever i was interested in um you know i think around seven years ago i got interested in in ethereum mining and and set up my own ethereum miner and, mm -hmm. and started looking at all the weird and wonderful things that were, were happening in crypto and uh, we ended up writing a paper together with one of my PhD students who's now uh, graduated, uh, Sex, Drugs and Bitcoin. And what we did was to use some techniques that we had otherwise utilized previously to understand the likelihood of insider trading in markets to yeah. um, explore the use of digital currencies for illicit payments. Yeah. Uh, and so this is something that we, we published in 2019. And I guess from there, really, my research agenda has focused on things like decentralized exchanges, mm -hmm. you know, decentralized borrowing and lending and all the weird and wonderful world of DeFi and financial Lego. And, and, and it's fascinating. And it's a world that's kind of, 
you know, clearly sort of, you know, just just grown and grown and, and, and kind of, you know, expanded in many different and unexpected ways. Um, and you've been researching of clearly the world of digital assets for some time. Um, maybe maybe to ground us in this conversation, could you kind of briefly walk us through how you see the, the evolution of digital assets over, you know, what's kind of been the last 15 years or so? What, what do you see as the key stages of development? Yeah, it's really interesting to think that, you know, how long we've had things like Bitcoin. Mm, so I, mm. I guess one of the um, key motivations of the original things like Bitcoin or, or digital assets was um, to provide a secure and anonymous payment mechanism, which was kind of free of the abilities of central banks to moderate or devalue these assets. And this was sort of Nakamoto's dream. You know, he put out mm. the white paper out in 2008. And on the 2nd or 3rd of January 2009, we started to see a payment system as we might imagine, or, you know, the transfer of value. And I like to explain it to people as really uh, analogous to Visa, right? There are, mm. there are miners, they, they act as the, the gatekeepers of the transactions on the network. As a, as a participant, I can propagate a, a transaction to them uh, along with a fee. So, you know, if you, mm. if you buy a coffee for two pounds or whatever, you know, you, your merchant may end up taking Visa, MasterCard, whoever it is, you know, 1% one, 1 of that transaction yeah. even if the the buyer and the seller with the same bank right 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 Abs ab absolutely so there was an economic incentive in in actually be able to to do that right um and and, def and therefore therefore there's an incentive for the for for the network to grow uh and it, and, it. and people to get so involved you started to have this transfer of value right that was facilitated right. by miners you'd offer them some kind of fee um there was also a block reward and whatnot right and so but really what you have is this ability to securely and anonymously transfer uh, dollars or, you know, digital dollars, let's say, bitcoins around the world. And we sort of moved from that, you know, around 2015 into something more like Ethereum. So, you know, the, the Bitcoin network was relatively constrained in the sense that it can keep track of, you know, how many Bitcoin Sean has or Nick has. Sure. Sean can transfer them to Nick. But really, there's not a lot else that you can do. That's why I liken it to a kind of visa analogy. Whereas if we start thinking about Ethereum and some of the other networks that have come along since then, you know, Solana, Cardano, Polkadot, these sorts of new and emerging uh, networks, you have the ability to actually run code. And so I think mm. of it much more similarly to Amazon Web Services, right? You, yeah. No one tells yeah. you what you can do on AWS, right? What you can mm -hmm. and can't do. I mean, within legal limits, right? You, you can really... <laughs> or, or what Amazon will let you do, right? <laughs> exactly, right. But I mean, you know, you can you can deploy a website, you could run something that, you know, you could you could deploy a Swift network. There's there's all sorts of uh, things you can do. And you're really constrained only by your your imagination and what you can code within the network. And right. so the Ethereum virtual machine really runs like this. And what that facilitated and what we saw through sort of 2017 was this ICO bubble. Right. So mm -hmm. I can create these assets and the asset may be nothing more than a Sean coin that has right. a million or 10 million or a billion uh, units in, in issue. I define who gets them at the start, maybe half go to Nick and half go to me, maybe I sell them, right? And, and so this really facilitated this first wave of innovation, fraud, scams, right? Of people trying to just, well, hey, I could, I could make a, a Swift coin and we'll see yeah. who wants to buy it, right? Hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not. I'm not, right? I'm not sure the Swift could make a token would be great Tesla. That. Yes, yeah, yeah, ab ab absolutely. So, 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 almost like a almost like a platform that can enable multiple different innovations. And, and I guess, uh, given it's it given it's not a regulated platform, then you know a thousand flowers can bloom effectively. That's it. And so we we sort of started to see this emergence of of tokens and and you know mm -hmm. token ecosystems where I'm gonna you know I sort of think about it sometimes as I'm gonna promise you I'm gonna build a spaceship. I'm going to sell mm. rides on the spaceship now. So you give me mm. money. With the money, I'll build the spaceship. Once the spaceship's built, then you can bring back your tokens and, and take some trips, right? And so yeah. we've seen, you know, real financial innovation or, or, sorry, real innovation. It doesn't have to be financial that has come out of this ecosystem. So, you know, one of the things I use a, a, a browser that's similar to Chrome, but it's called Brave Browser. And Brave mm. Browser rewards me instead of Google advertising to me and Google taking the fee, you know, I get, let's say, half of the fee in right. Brave tokens. And whenever somebody wants to adv advertise to me, they need to buy those tokens, whether from myself or the ecosystem itself. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can have a, a utility token. And I think it's very important to understand that this is different from 
a blockchain, right? Because any mm. movement in these tokens is undertaken on the Ethereum virtual machine. So really right. the Ethereum network operates as the kind of clearinghouse, if you like, in the same way that the London Stock Exchange might of, well, who owns what? And, and if there's going to be a movement of basic attention tokens from myself to, to Nick, then that needs to be undertaken on the Ethereum network. And so right, it's very right. easy. It's like 30 lines of code to write um, your own token on the Ethereum network. Whereas mm -hmm. if you want to build a blockchain like Bitcoin, like Ethereum, like Polkadot, like Cardano, you know, this is a very different enterprise. You really need to be able to bring in whether miners for a proof of work network or, mm -hmm. or validators for a proof of stake network. You need an ecosystem of, of, of participants, node operators, people who want to submit transactions. Right, and right. so you know, there's there's many, there may be, I think people sometimes say, oh, there's 24,000, you know, uh, digital or cryptocurrencies, right? And I think we really want to try and split those up from, you know, digital utility tokens and, and actual kind of blockchain based native tokens like cryptocurrencies. So there's the, there's the tokens that people have created on the top of this infrastructure. And then there's the tokens that then sit actually inside the infrastructure kind of itself yeah. and, a, and a part of part of how 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 that works. So, I, I mean, I guess this is really fascinating because, you know, the sort of the, the crypto space seems to be everywhere where these days and, and, and a lot of terminology is thrown around. So I think we should go in a little bit more and demystify some of this a bit. So uh, and but before we do, I did want to shout out for uh, for questions. Please do submit your questions on uh, on the on the feed on LinkedIn Live, um, and we will pick them up at the end. But going into demystifying, you've mentioned digital tokens several times, Sean. Right? Um, what are they? Right? What what is a token at it at its core, and, and what kind of why should we care? Yeah. So I think a token is similar in some senses to a share, right? I mean, a share is just something that we all agree represents a fraction of a company. So I don't, you know, when I buy, even if I buy 10% of BHP, I don't suddenly get ownership rights to some mine somewhere or, or, right, or right. some, you know, fraction of the of the factory floor. It's it's an agreement that there is, you know, some cash flow or some some ownership of this underlying thing. And I, I think that it's a it's a good analogy in the sense that tokens are only as, you know, if we think about a company, there's a lot mm. of, com there's 2,200 listed companies on the Australian Stock Exchange. And, you know, maybe 1,000 of them, probably the bottom 1,000, are often nothing more than what we call four white pegs in the ground, right? Mm. They just mm. have the right mm. to explore and to drill for assets, coal, gold, whatever's hot these days, right? right. right. They, they have the right to drill there. And look, if yes, if they find something, then happy days, you know, I'll be a part owner in that and I'll benefit from, the development of that ecosystem that they're they're sort of uh, they have in their plan right and so mm -hmm. if we think about a, a general stock market you'd have this initial public offering where we would define uh, the, the goals the risks who owns what and it's quite similar in the digital currency space you, you know these tokens generally have a white paper that sort of acts similar to an to an, uh, an ipo prospectus that says well what are we trying to do here and and, and how what might it work and how many tokens will there be and how many will you have and what will they be worth? And so I think what we're developing here is something that, you know, we might think of it as funny money at the start or monopoly money mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. it is. But there is true value in whether we look at traditional tokens or NFTs or anything else. And in moving them around and figuring out, well, in, what, in which ways do we move them where we lose them and people hack them or, you yeah. know, in which, in which kinds of exchanges can we uh, mm -hmm. trade them with a centralized, decentralized, we start to build security and, and, and effectively infrastructure, which I think can be used in the future to really start to disintermediate traditional exchanges or even operators mm. like Swift. Mm. Controversial. <laughs> we'll come on to that, that piece and the payments piece, but, um, I'm just thinking about the the the, the actual token itself because I liked your analogy about you know it's a share you know a, a different expression almost as a share of ownership right mm. so so in that context right do, what I'm often asked is is does a token actually require a blockchain what's your view on that well you know the Australian stock exchange runs without a blockchain even though they've been promising one for 5 years um, the LSE operates with their own system. So, no, I mean, I think ultimately you do need some kind of database. But, you know, if we think right. about 
um, stock exchanges in, in Holland in the 15th century, you know, we had share certificates and those share certificates mm. with appropriate, you know, signatures or security would give us some um, sense that you are the actual owner and, you know, you're share number one and I might be share number 345. We can do tokens with a database. I think mm. that one of the reasons that it's been so successful to build tokens on a blockchain platform is that they're decentralized. There's no one who can tell you you can do it, you can't do it. You know, if I want to right. list a company on the Australian Stock Exchange, I might need to spend a couple million dollars and at least two or three hundred thousand per year to maintain that. That's not the case in in the in the world of, of decentralized um, blockchains. And I think you've got this real ability to access global liquidity. And I think that's one mm. of the things that is very rare. You know, you look at uh, issues in Australia, and I've always been confused why Australian issues specifically exclude American participants. And right. it's all oh, because the long arm of the American legal system can come and get you even if you are an Australian company issuing sure. Australian shares. And I think that the, the notion of that, particularly at the inception of these things, 2017, 2018, there was no regulation. There wasn't even, you know, mm. the ability or the, the desire to structure your token or security such that it would not pass the Howey test and would therefore not be considered security by the SEC, in which case they could never come and touch you, right? And I think we've right, come right, right. 180 degrees from there. We've really started to see a clamoring for regulation from mm. the participants in, in this ecosystem to try to ensure to try to smooth the path of, of migration for traditional tokenized assets. And I think mm, you can mm. totally do it without a blockchain. You, you just need a database, right? However you structure mm -hmm. that, whether that's a physical book or, you know, a database on a computer or a blockchain. But I think that one of the benefits of blockchains is this access to global liquidity that has been very right. difficult in, you know, even in the MIFID II environment of Europe, yeah. you know, fine, you can access European liquidity, but go get investors from Japan or the US, maybe it becomes a little harder. Yeah, yeah. And that's a really interesting point about about liquidity, because um, certainly we see on the on the security side um, that that there's increasing kind of interest and demand from Swift's clients, financial institutions actually turning traditional securities like shares or stocks into tokens the, 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 themselves. Um, so do you see for those kind of institutions that liquidity is the main benefit of, of actually doing that or are there other benefits? I mean, some people talk about fractionalization, in, in, you know, a, a increasing investability uh, or increasing risk diversification. How, how, do you, how do you see the benefits for traditional FIs tokenizing existing securities? Sure. So, yeah, I think one of them definitely is accessing this sort of wider market. So if we look at uh, a platform, a centralized exchange like FTX, they've been quite instrumental in, in building what we would commonly think of as something like an American depository receipt, right? So mm -hmm. you could have an Australian company, BHP, listed in Australia, uh, some investment bank like uh, Credit Suisse or whoever packages up, you know, 10 BHP shares and then goes and lists that as an, an ADR on NICE or NASDAQ. We're now mm -hmm. susceptible to, you know, U.S. reporting, which was generally the benefit, right? If you came from a, an environment like Indonesia or, you know, an emerging economy where there was relatively poor regulation, you may want to have this sort of mark of quality that, hey, look, it's not that we're listed yeah. in, in the U.S., but we need to adhere to their regulations. Yep. Um, yep. FTX took that idea of this ADR and said, hey, well, why don't we just take Tesla shares that cost, you know, $1,000 and we could just put them on our own. We take one, we'll put it in a drawer in Germany. Yep. That's just happened to be where they put the drawer and we'll list a token against it and we'll allow people to then trade that token. And, and what you do see is, you know, that these are traded in not generally single shares or, or even like in the US, you have board lots, right? You start mm -hmm. trading a hundred, I don't know, shares at a thousand dollars each. It's hundred thousand dollars. It may be inaccessible to the typical yeah, yeah, yeah. retail investor. Whereas you start That's seeing it. things trading on FTX, you know, it's 1.5 or it's 0.75, you know, there's no, a token is infinitely divisible for, for better right. or worse. So I think that that is one component, but I definitely think the liquidity play is, is a second component. So just accessing a, a broader market of liquidity. But really, I think it's the financial innovation that's really driving this. And so one of the great examples that I think to is Society General. They put 20 mm -hmm. billion euros, sorry, 20 million euros of of bonds on the Ethereum blockchain, on the public right. Ethereum blockchain. They're not running a private chain. They're not, you know, they're just letting it out into the wild. And one of the things that becomes really interesting is this concept of financial Legos, 
or, or mm. composability. Mm. That I've got, yeah. you know, well, I've got a, a token here that that is a financial asset, but but this person over there is, you know, they're called MakerDAO, and they've got a lending platform. And so Society General came to them at some point and said, "Well, could we borrow ten million dollars against our twenty million dollars worth of bonds that we've published on the blockchain?" Make it out. Said, sure, you know, here's here's ten million mm. die, and I don't think you know Make it out may not have even existed at the time that Society General chose to put that on the blockchain. But there's now this sort of developing ecosystem yeah. that your token can find access to and, and start yep. becoming you know composable and interoperable with this interesting you know sort of world of, of DeFi. Uh, and so that they, those those bonds then become liabilities that then can be borrowed against and then then relent on right and then you get that but you, you know i think always in innovation we look for the sort of that network effect building right and and this so. sort of you know you build that that kind of eco ecosystem um i mean you know some some analyst reports i read project that that, that kind of part of the market the tokenized securities market is going to grow to something like 24 trillion dollars by 2027 which would be the kind of then that that's kind of roughly equivalent to the sort of the capitalization of the new york stock exchange right so sure. i mean with this momentum building is that the kind of ambitious growth that you would expect to see or or do you see something potentially different sean well i think that um it would have been much easier to make that prediction perhaps six months ago before <laughs> the entire crypto yeah. world and in fact you know the share markets um uh, had a bit of a, a hiccup with their lack of easy money. But yeah, I definitely think, you know, you, you think of the combination of global access to liquidity and what we can do with these assets. And I, that kind of goes back to this idea that I mentioned before, that if we can build secure infrastructure for trading tokenized assets, whether they happen to be browser tokens or NIC tokens or bonds or, or shares in a company, then you start to open the door to regulated, you know, financial markets where you've got traditional securities traded. And if I start to think mm -hmm. about, you know, if I was the Australian Stock Exchange, if I was the, the NYSC, I would be very concerned about a system where you can have a primary issuance, secondary trading. It all mm -hmm. happens, quote unquote, for free. There's, there's no yeah. one to pay. And I can access not just domestic liquidity in you know, the UK or Australia or the US, but I can now access liquidity anywhere in the world. You know, I, I think that that mm -hmm. definitely becomes something that is is very powerful. And we've seen mm -hmm. that with these decentralized exchanges, for example, when, mm -hmm. when they first came out in sort of 2018, 2019, the volumes were abysmal, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. trading a million dollars a day in, in yeah, a thousand yeah. nothing tokens, who cares? And as I continue to teach this to my students and update my slides each year, I'm always surprised. And I say, okay, you know, until it was is 2022. And suddenly the value traded in, in six decentralized exchanges exceeded the total value traded in the LSE. Mm -hmm. And it's not even, you know, it's not even ASX, right? And you start thinking, yeah. well, is this is this a competitor? Well, I guess if we're doing 150 billion US dollars a month in volumes and the LSE is doing like 80 or 110, then yeah, suddenly I guess it doesn't become that infeasible that we have something here that could be a real challenger or competitor or, or some kind of counterpart to traditional financial institutions and marketplaces. I mean, that is fascinating. And that is kind of a clear proof point of the momentum kind of building, building in, 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 this, in this space. I'm going to switch us in a moment from securities to payments because digital currency is also particularly hot at the moment. Um, for those who are on, on this, the, the session, uh, I can see a couple of questions coming in. We will get to them uh, shortly. Please do keep sending questions in via the comments feed on, on, on LinkedIn Live. So let's now move on to digital currencies, Sean. We've seen a lot of growth in unregulated money, and now central banks are trying to create new forms of regulated money as central bank digital currencies or, or CBDCs. We've also seen a lot of news in recent days around stable coins. So I'm going to go to stable coins first in this. Um, you know, for the again to demystify this for the audience, what are stable coins? How do they work? But more importantly, how to help us understand the importance of stable coins to the crypto ecosystem? Totally, yeah. So look, I think the collapse of UST really shined a spotlight on well, what are these things? What are they doing? Mm. Um, so I, there's really three 
separate kinds of stable coins in existence. So we've got fiat backed. So this is again similar to this idea of an American depository receipt. We take a draw somewhere, we put a US dollar in it, and against every US dollar in the draw, we issue a token. Now, as long as there's credibility around or, or auditability, let's say, around how how many are in the draw and you know how many tokens you've issued, then that's actually a very stable system. Right now, mm, we mm. saw, you know, in 2019 or 2020, there was a journal of finance article called Is Bitcoin Untethered? And this really examined mm. the credibility of the or, or started to shine a light onto the credibility or lack thereof of, of USDT. You know, we've got US dollar tether. We've got things like USDC that came out as a response to that. Hey, we'll do one mm. that's a bit more audited. These are the right. fiat backed ones. And we haven't yeah. really seen we've seen little wobbles like when mm. UST collapsed, we saw USDT drop to about 95, 96 cents. We've mm -hmm. seen before that maybe 98. But in general, there seems to be this consensus that even if there's not 100% backing, there's enough backing that they can survive effectively a run on the bank. So mm -hmm. that's for you, fact. Another interesting um, form of so the, the biggest this is currency called DAI, D -A -I, that's mm. issued by MakerDAO. Here you would deposit, for example, $150 worth of Ethereum and you could borrow 100 DAI tokens, which would, uh, you know, be pegged to the USD. Now, just mm. like the Argentinian peso, your peg is only <laughs> as good as your backing, right? Yeah, but yeah, here yeah. you've got what we call over collateralization. So you've put mm. down $150 of assets, similar to what you might do with a mortgage, right? You know, you don't borrow right, right. 110%, or at least not in Australia. Sure. You don't borrow 110% <laughs> of the value of the house. You borrow you yeah. know, a lower value. You're over collateralized yeah. in the sense that you deposit more to borrow something back. So we haven't seen any any real problems with DAI because as soon as the, the value of the uh, crypto backing drops to maybe 110, suddenly the assets are, are sold, just like you know a, a bank foreclosure. The mm, assets are mm. sold, the debt is repaid, and if there's anything left, the person who bought the person can keep the money they borrowed. That's fine because their assets were the distressed right, assets were right, sold. Right, right, right. The right. final that we saw was this new form, which was very innovative. Uh, and everything in the crypto world is really built on the fly and tested on the fly, right? It's like mm. we're, we're flying a rocket ship. Um, it's very difficult to just take your rocket ship to the mechanic and say, oh, please, sir, could you fix it, right? It's, it's more mm -hmm. of these space odyssey movies where it might all go a bit pear-shaped. And that's exactly what we saw with the algorithmic stable coin. So, you know, UST was a great example, but there's others, Fraxis and others. And the idea here was, well, we'll have a stable coin and we'll have a volatile uh, support for the peg, let's say. We'll mm -hmm. call it a vol coin. In, in the case of UST, it was called Luna. And what we'll do is we'll have some external price oracle that tells us what the value of Luna is. And so, you know, if the value of Luna is $100, you could bring one Luna in and you could say, hey, give me 100 UST, or you could swap back the other way. So you could always swap mm -hmm. between these two within right. a, the Terra blockchain, which was separate from, you know, separate from Ethereum, separate from Bitcoin. And what we saw was a real attack on the Luna ecosystem. So at some point, uh, they decided to just test. Well, hey, you've now got not 250 million, you know, not 2.5 billion, but $25 billion worth of assets that you've generated. And, you know, as that's going up, well, the price of Luna's going up, but maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. Mm. But if I can borrow, just like George Soros borrowed a ton of, you know, Argentinian pesos, or I believe he even had a little incident with the UK, right? Uh, but if I can borrow enough, <laughs> if I can borrow enough pesos, and I borrow them and I sell them back to the central bank at one USD, if I can borrow more of them than the central bank has USDs, eventually they say, well, hang on, mate, I can't buy your pesos back from you. The whole thing collapses and you now pay, you know, mm, peso mm. going to 10 to 1 per USD and you just pay everyone's debt back and, hey, happy days, you've attacked the system and made a bunch of money. So this is effectively what happened in the, in the algorithmic stablecoin sense is that if we just dump a bunch of, of USD, people kind of buy distressed UST and then they go and swap it for Luna and hope that they can sell the Luna for a hundred dollars or a hundred percent of what they bought the UST for. And then it sort of causes a death spiral, right? Where the price of Luna tends towards zero, yeah, once yeah, it's yeah. At zero then you're suddenly minting, you know, the, the minting went from, you know, they'd been at for six months, there were about 300,000 Luna in existence. And in the last four days of, of Luna's existence before the whole network shut down, 
there was seven trillion, right? Because wow. it turns out. So you just went with this there. curve to add, yeah, to add basically zero and then infinite minting. Swap my one UST for some lunar. They say, well, here's you know, here's a million lunar, mate. And yeah. you go and try and sell it for whatever you can, which is also point zero 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 something. Mm -hmm. right? So I think um, to answer your question, you know, those are the three kinds of stable coins that we've seen. And it's only really been We've seen concerns about these mm. fiat backed ones. We haven't really seen issues with the crypto backs because they just they get distressed. You see some deleveraging, right? People's people's mm -hmm. uh, distressed assets get sold. But the algorithmic was where there was really problems of no hard backing. Right. And that's yeah. just like Argentinian government deciding, well, we're going to put it to one to one as the peg until you tell me I can't do it otherwise. The, the importance of these in the crypto ecosystem, I think is threefold. So one of them is acting as these sort of financial rails. So if I think of mm, something like the Australian mm. Stock Exchange, I can swap BHP for Aussie dollars. I can swap Telstra for Aussie dollars. You know, I, right. I go in and out of Aussie dollars yep, yep, to yep. get between the 2000 listed securities. And, you know, in the UK, I might do it with, with British pounds. And in the US, I might do it with USD. And we see a similar situation in, in the crypto ecosystem that a lot of these uh, assets are traded, you know, you've got to trade an asset in a pair. It's got to be X for Y. Right. right and what right. we see is the, the Y, if you like, is something stable, right? So we often okay. see USDT or USDC as the sort of financial rails of this ecosystem. So the base Another, unit effectively then, Sean. Exactly. Yeah. Base yeah. unit, you know, it could have been anything. It could have been a, a Euro stable coin. It, when it started, you know, if you look at around 2017, it was really Bitcoin. Um, mm. that the, the sort of the centralized exchanges were using. So even if you wanted to trade a token, which is uh, sort of, you know, housed on Ethereum, you may have to go from that token to Bitcoin back to another token on right. the Ethereum network right. in the right. centralized exchange. Uh, it really moved to USDT and then sort of through to USDC. And the other big thing or component that these play in the ecosystem is to act as a safe haven asset. So mm. when you know, we see some sand in the gears or when, when the price of crypto is dropping, I may not want to, I may want to sell my crypto and put my wealth into something that I believe has more stability than the asset that's that's dumping. Okay. But I may not want to bring my assets back to Australia. Maybe I prefer to bring them to the British Virgin Islands or um, who knows where, right? And so I can kind of keep them in this crypto land, if you like, by moving them into or trading them into something that's a stable coin. And so I think right. they act really as this, the, the financial rails, they act as, as a safe haven asset. And they, um, yeah, that's their main uh, ecosystem or main component in, in the ecosystem, as well as providing for remittance and payments without the sort of currency risk, right? So if yeah, I want to yeah, send yeah. money back right. to my family in the Philippines or something like this, then, you know, often it's, or make a payment for, for a, a larger transaction, then I may prefer to do that in, in a stable coin than doing it in a cryptocurrency that cool. has volatility. Cool. So we've got so we've got a unit of payment and we've got a safe haven asset here as the so stable coins playing a really important role. So um I, I I'm conscious there are questions coming in, but I, I want to do two quick fire ones to 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 wrap to wrap up mm -hmm. the stable coin kind of discussion. Um uh, one is uh, we now see a lot of discussion about stable coins being regulated. Will this make them mainstream or be regulated out of existence? What do you think, Sean? <laughs> in a, in a I sentence. Think, yeah, I think um, I think it's a race. So I think whoever can gain credibility and adoption first is really going to become that sort of base unit. In the same way that we right. see USD as a you know a global currency, or ha historically has been. You know, it's just because they had global dominance first. There's no reason it couldn't have been the euro. Maybe it just didn't exist at the time that we were generating sort of reserve currencies, right? So I think a central bank digital currency could do a fantastic job of this if it was free, like if it was wild and on the right. Ethereum network and it, there wasn't a whitelist, we didn't tell you, hey, these are the people who are approved to use it. Then I think that there's a CBDC would have far more credibility than something like a, a USDT or USDC. So I think regulation will help. Um, but I, I think it's a race. I think whoever can mm -hmm. sort of gain adoption. And, and who's going to who's going to win that battle for adoption? A, a regulated stable coin or a CBDC? What's your what's your bet? 
Uh, you know, I think a lot of governments are betting on CBDC, so let's see. Um, I don't think there's going to be space, really, for, uh, you know, we're dealing with a global ecosystem. I don't. I think there's no reason you couldn't have many CBDCs, yeah. but I don't think, I think it will be similar to the USD adoption by, you know, small Southeast Asian countries or South American countries. You know, I think there will be something that becomes dominant, whether that's the EU yuan or the, you know, the, the, the Canadian dollar, E Luna or whatever it's called, right? I think it's got to be, you know, whoever can get that critical mass first. And I think CBDCs have a really strong advantage in that they have central bank up, central mm-hmm. bank backing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. We've got some great questions coming in, so we're going to take those Ooh. those now. Um, uh, the first one uh, comes from uh, Rohit Mahaltra. Rohit, thank you for your question. Uh, Rohit says. Um, how can someone hedge information risks uh, by utility tokens against analogy specific assets? Does that does that make sense, Sean? Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure what an analogy specific asset is. Um, I mean, I guess if we think about how you can hedge the variety of utility tokens that exist, I mean, this has been one of the really large and growing components of this ecosystem is is perpetual uh, futures. So if you think about traditional futures markets, which is where someone like BitMEX, you know, made a big name in the 2018s, 2019s, you have an expiry every three months and liquidity is fragmented across those. And there'll be differences because of of basis risk, you know, there'll be differences in in the uh, prices of those things, the further out you go. Perpetual futures really have an expire. They're kind of like continually expiring every eight hours and you pay a funding rate or mm-hmm. you receive a funding rate or, or, or pay a funding rate, depending on the difference between the spot rate and the underlying. And so I think that this may be what Rohit is asking is, um, how can I short sell crap coins? And I think that, you know, uh, perpetual futures provided by people like Binance and, and, and other venues really try to facilitate this, right? So we mm-hmm. we take the spot and we sort of have a funding rate which is related to the difference between the perpetual rate and the spot rate. But what we're building is something that has a complete market in the sense that right. I have the ability to go short or long, potentially with leverage, right. assets that, you know, I would not be able to gain borrow for, right? right. And, and right. this is right. amazing. Like in the Australian Stock Exchange, outside of the top two or 300, there's no way you can get borrow for, 2,200 mm. listed listed entities. And what that means is you can't short sell them, right? right Even if right. I believe that they're, they're worth nothing, there's no way that I can short them. And I think that that's one of the innovations that these perpetual futures really aim to fix in this market is if we're going to have um, people bring their information about the, the lack of credibility of the Luna token. Well, yep. if I can only sell it if I've already bought it, then that's problematic, right? Whereas right, if right, I believe right, right. that it it's going to go down. And we saw this, right? So before yep. Luna collapsed or as Luna was collapsing, there, there was like this hugely negative funding rate because so many people were selling the perpetual that they wanted to try to incentivize anyone to take yep. the other side and borrow it, right? So I, yeah, yeah. I think that, you know, maybe that's Rohit's question is, you know, how can we bring information about the the bad goodness or otherwise of these tokens? And I think that perpetuals really have given a lot of an answer to that. Makes sense. Make makes sense. Makes sense. I'm going to take two more questions, but we are short on time, so so let's let's cover them sort of quick fire. Um, uh, we've got uh, we've got one question from uh, Cohen, who says, uh, given the current turmoil in the quick in crypto markets, what's your rev- view on preventing downward liquidity spirals, both in crypto and tokenized security? So, is there is there a way of preventing downward liquidity spirals, short or is this just a function of how the market works? It's totally a function of how it works. So if you've got decentralized borrowing ladder, the borrowing lending through these over collateralized loans, that will generate big, you know, positive reinforcement on the up and negative reinforcement on the down. As soon as those distressed assets get sold, someone has to buy them. And that's going to lead to this. You also so, same with the. So it's kind of like price. like the the almost like the 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 sort of the the controls or whatever that you see in centralized exchanges of stop loss and things like that that actually. It would be totally only that would be the ways right? of doing that, if, but then you have to have some centralized authority to be able to. If I can get a hundred times leverage and the price goes up one percent, I've made a hundred percent. I can reinvest that, and as long as it keeps going up, self-perpetuating cycle. As yep. soon as it goes down, I've got to dump it, right? And I think this is why people have always been about, you know, buy the dips, uh, sell the highs, right? And right. because 
it's going to swing wildly. So I don't, without absent regulation, I don't really see how we can prevent this. Cool. Okay. And final question that comes for, from, uh, from Andrew. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, in practical terms, what's the biggest obstacle to widespread adoption of digital assets? I think the, the biggest obstacle is actually the lack of regulatory frameworks. Right. Mm. So I think, you know, the UK uh, in Australia, they just say, oh, not our problem. In Canada, they say, well, until you deliver the, the, the physical bitcoins, it's a futures market. So we'll regulate it under the futures regulation. In the UK, mm. they're starting to adopt this regulatory sandbox, sandbox approach. But until you have regulation that really gives um, investors and institutions confidence around um, the you know the the AML the K Y you know we don't want we don't want to be facilitating terrorism with bonds and so then traditional institutions are not going to feel confident to sort of unleash their traditional uh, secure or their traditional securities in a tokenized form out into the wild where they can be used for all sorts of purposes and so I think right. we really need our regulators to step up and start just you know, figuring out well, what are best practices. And, and we're starting to see that, but I think that is the one single largest hurdle because once we get traditional financial assets, we can still have this composability. We can still have financial innovation. Yeah. We can still have DeFi and financial Legos. We can just have it with traditional assets, which may themselves lack, you know, the sort of inherent yeah. volatility. If we start linking it to real world cash flows through companies and whatnot, then we start to get a really exciting ecosystem and we get, you know, we look look at someone like Uber, right? I mean, who would have thought that an app could and people's cars could decentralize a you know taxi industry that had a stranglehold on the monopoly of of, of moving yeah, people around? Yeah. So I think really regulation is is the key. Regulation key to then for bringing in the, the established world and, and taking a, traditional assets and taking advantage of some of these tech technologies. Um, that's, it. that's a that's a great point, I think, to 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 to, to kind of bring this. Thank you, uh, thank you, also those who also sent questions in. We're we're kind of out of time, but we will pass them to Sean uh, Sean afterwards and see if we can get you some some answers on, on those. Um, Sean, it's been fantastic to talk with you today. This is clearly yeah, a really yeah. rapidly evolving space. Um, where should people go to find out more? What what research do you have coming out next? Yeah, sure. So look, um, I'm the head of decentralized assets at the Digital Finance Cooperative Research Center. So, um, you know, we're a, a large um, uh, corporate research center bringing together industry, government and, and universities in Australia. We, we've got $180 million of funding. So, I mean, they can check out dfcrc.com. Uh, if they're interested in sort of becoming an industry partner, maybe interested in doing a PhD, uh, these sorts of things would be great. So thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it, Nick. Thank you, Sean. Uh, really appreciate your your time uh, your time today. So that was the first uh, of our Inside Innovation uh, live sessions. Um, in our in our next uh, session, we'll actually be delving uh, further into this world and and talking in particular about uh, interoperability and how that can help uh, drive the growth of the tokenized uh, asset market. That is on uh, Wednesday, the 13th of, of July at the same time. So uh, please tune in uh, at the same time on, on Wednesday, the, the 13th, uh, and we'll be able to uh, to continue the conversation. Thank you, uh, everyone who's joined today, and huge thank you for, uh, to Sean for sharing your insights. Take care, all. Have a great day. Ta-da.